Andrew, welcome to the Better World Leaders podcast. Thank you, Tim. And uh, I mean, I typically start by asking people where they are and you know, what's going on you know, sort of outside the window. So where are you as you join us today? I'm currently based in my warehouse in the industrial estate of Byron Bay in Australia. Wow, beautiful Byron. I, I, I haven't personally visited the industrial estate. I imagine it's probably not the most scenic part of town. It's, well, it's become pretty trendy. I think that was, there's a lot of hipsters, lots of cafes and yoga studios and uh, retails coming in as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. How long have you been up in Byron? Uh, entering my sixth year. Yeah, okay. It wasn't planned, I have to say. It was um, visiting a friend and then thinking about evolving with my plans and then I was just introduced to a few people, like-minded people, and I love swimming. I love the beach. I love yep. the hinterland, etc. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's a beautiful part of the world. I mean, you know, with the audience of, of of this show primarily being Australian for the moment, I imagine most people are familiar with Byron. But for those out there in the community, and we certainly have had listeners already, you know, from China and India and and, and Canada, you know, Byron is an idyllic spot you know, sort of in this beautiful, you know, sort of um, position, as you've rightly said, where you've got a pick of fabulous swimming and, and surf beaches and then a wonderful, well, it, it is a rainforest, really, the sort of the hinterland, isn't it? You know, you can kind of get in there into the old growth forest and, and really kind of let loose. So, mm. yeah, good fun, good fun. Um, and, and my, my, your journey, you know, sort of takes some telling. So we, we, we might sort of, you know, take that immediate, you know, sort of, um, mention of you know you sort of a happenstance brings you to byron you know maybe we'll sort of retreat away from that moment six years ago as kind of as far back as you like really and, and then sort of shuffle back up to it you know sort of with the first question you know really sort of where where did you begin and and, and where was your early journey spent my my attraction to this area Uh, It definitely comes from my family. My father was born in Java as a Dutch Indonesian. So I was brought up very much in a Indonesian aesthetic with food and decorative arts. And my father spoke with a bit of an Indonesian accent. So that was uh, in regards to my family, that was uh, post-war. They moved to Australia like many immigrants in the late 40s. Yeah. Yeah. And where were you born? Where did you have your childhood? I was born, I was very privileged actually, although we're very poor like most migrants, but brought up in a country town in the southwest of WA. Okay. And for a child brought up in a country town, I was just amazing. Very, very lucky. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know the southern part of Western Australia very well at all. I mean, are we talking Margaret River or further south? We're talking about maybe uh, an hour and a half inland from Margaret River. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's some good wines, as I understand, from, from down there. Yeah, it's great surf, um, great wines, great vineyards, pretty low key. And I think it's part of, I mean, the wines are great and the vineyard facilities for tourists and locals a very scenic very sort of pseudo european feel about the vineyards yeah um and of course the the diversity of immigrants that moved in um there's a sort of a nice uh, australian european feel yeah i mean yeah yeah i mean they're, they're very i mean when you travel around it, it could be said for any rural area in the southwest of or any country area there's a series of immigrants that have made their little mark in the townships and uh, the second generation have worked really hard because their parents have done the same and so yeah it's 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 so in the case of wa there's lots of italians greeks and yugoslav folk predominantly yeah and i like i loved it i felt very at home yeah yeah, yeah, and 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 so I mean, very similar to my upbringing. I grew up in, the, in a very, very small village, you know, in in rural Britain. We didn't have the the wineries, um, breweries for sure, um, 
but yeah, I, I, I can certainly, you know, sort of connect strongly and empathize with the benefits, you know, of, of that kind of uh, upbringing and, and having lots of interesting people around and, and a real appreciation also, I find still now to this day as I, as I you know, have returned to the country in a way you know, in southern New South Wales to raise my family, um, you know, for, for the world around you and, you know, less sort of distracted by, you know, sort of the big city and the, and the bright lights, you know, you, you, you sort of, I think, find it, it's more in the, in the blood and in the core, you know, the natural world when, when you grow up in a rural and regional area. Mm. Yeah, I can relate to that. Okay, we're having a chord early on. Very good, very good. So tell me, you, you sort of, uh, we'll, we'll sort of, unless there's any sort of particular highlights, we'll sort of skip through, you know, sort of school and so on. And, and I mean, you have this really, you know, sort of incredible journey through, you know, one sort of particular career and then into, you know, sort of the, the current one and, and, and this really fascinating, you know, sort of, um, you know, change and, and, and pivot but you know sort of early career in visual arts what what sort of drew you or propelled you to that area or or, or, or that medium one could say um well it's natural gravitation I mean, it, so my parents moved from the country in my well, i was about 11 12 to the city because okay. i have elder siblings and they needed to enter the workforce so i entered year seven at primary school and I, when I say very fortunate, because, you know, I ended up doing a BA, Bachelor of Arts in Fine Art, then, which is a long time ago, but today you would have to probably write a small thesis. And then it was just submitting a folio. And, and that was when it, come, when it came to writing or reading. I just avoided it. And of course, and I'm thinking of all the people uh, in current times in education that really falter or struggle because they're inherently in some sort of spectrum, they get marginalised. In many cases, they get assistance and help. But for me in a country town, that progression where lots of children of immigrants who struggled in some shape or form, maybe there was trauma there. The schooling was quite uh, forgiving and the students sort of went on to high school. And that was certainly the case for me. So when I entered first year high school, second year, which is grade eight, grade nine, I left in grade nine, if I'm correct, but second year high school, because I was virtually having a nervous breakdown. And I remember my guidance teacher or vacation teacher for employment quickly assessed my strengths and then she made contact with a departmental store and ended up being an assistant to the prop maker of the departmental store. Okay. And as soon as I entered that space, I knew I was in my element. So when I say, so sorry, just to interject, so I'm just curious, so props, we're talking about sort of window dressings? And, absolutely. And yeah, yep. so like very, very small scale sort of stage production. Totally, it? totally. Yeah. And this is a, a very large departmental store. And, I mean, they still exist, although most of it, it's working on laptops. They still have prop makers and it's very, all of that industry is driven by the market. So a lot of the products supply the display examples yes but in my time we had to make them and the prop makers were very skilled craftsmen in their mm. own right so mm. i was very fortunate to be brought up in that space of having a very tactile yeah tactile experience it was priceless yeah 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 so the strengths what were the strengths that this person identified in you at that time well um he just gave me a lot of free reign to, to, and of course I learned how to use tools. And um, I mean, it's also the sign of the times. It was also post hippie period. We're talking about the early seventies and um, it was sort of quite wild. And the, the gay fraternity that were also involved in window dressing and all of that, it was a very colorful time. So within that, 
there's a lot of latitude to explore design, drawing, graphics, filmmaking, um, working with materials, working with machinery. It was a great apprenticeship, if that makes sense. No, no, it does. I mean, I can certainly understand. And yeah, I've got you know, a brother and a brother-in-law who are both creatives. Yeah, they're both musicians, but, you know, their journeys have been very different to my own, but I can certainly understand the correlation there, I think, certainly between their experience and yours is latitude and just having that freedom to sort of explore and express. Mm-hmm. That, that in of itself, you know, sort of becomes a, you know, pathway of discovery and then application of what what you discover your strengths and, and skills are. So from, you know, sort of, Small-scale stage production, window dressing, where did the journey go from there? Um, I wanted to improve my drawing skills, so I ended up doing two years of night school uh, in drawing and painting and graphics. And then the following year, I just so I was about 18 now, I went straight into doing two years of graphics full-time, and then I went straight into three years of doing fine art. Okay, okay, so more study. And then where did the career sort of take you on after this now sort of more Um, specific focus on graphics? Gee, um, it was more, it was more so when you're doing fine art, you're exposed to fine art history. And then in that area of history, you start learning about uh, cultural history and how art was shaped through the history of, you know, of, of what cultural communities around the world. And historically artists reflected the times that they were part of. And during that period, that was very interesting and very compelling to learn about cultural history and art's relationship to it. And then I started deal delving into my own personal cultural history and that sort of became first and foremost of great importance but during this period in my early 20s I also took on an interest in architecture and urban cultures uh, how civilizations in communities historically have functioned and where that overlapped in with fine art so so that became a slight preoccupation with my art practice, which was taking on cultural uh, systems to do with, with culture. In other words, how religion and politics and, and culture created art as well as created cultural lifestyle. So it was an overlap between art and uh, architecture and how systems prevailed, living systems prevailed. So it was just multi-woven multi and it took, I basically started creating art that responded to that sort of multi-layered um, involvement. And I think a lot of that has come from, from my understanding more about my parents, but also at the same time, knowing the massive, massive amount of secrecy that they were holding back. And, um, and I didn't know hardly anything about their history because their cultural history post-war. So anything pre-war was an unknown. They are what I call the third category of the Holocaust survivor, which was secrecy and denial. And that's a whole nother conversation. But that's sort of woven into my art practice that inevitably led to an interest in ecology, which we can talk about uh, thereafter. But a part of where I'm, what I'm doing in my interest in present day engagement with Subpod and related has all come from this journey of, of cultural identity and uh, the, the story of my parents' um, history evolving through circumstances. And that, that's actually an amazing and complex and multi-layered uh, journey, which I'm sure millions of people around the world have experienced and are still experiencing today. Oh, Displa- we're talking about displacement. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah yeah and i mean i have think yeah millions of people who have experienced it yeah people are experiencing it right now and i think you know it, 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 it's this i don't know why it's hotly debated but it's a hotly debated question you know so how many people are going to be displaced in you know the next decade you know and the decades beyond because of you know climate because of economic instability all of that's wrapped up together so I mean, I think I'm, I'm going to take the invitation of the segue there to, 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 to talk about what you are doing now, but I, I'd just like to reflect for a moment on, you know, I suppose the early genesis of, you know, I think three, certainly threads that I've sort of picked up in, 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 in you know, the research that I've done about your backstory. You know, it, it's, it's this combination of, you know, sort of community and ecology with creativity. And yeah, something. Yeah, you know, I'll use the C word. Yeah, you know, for the first time in this conversation, before it becomes a specific focus. But you know, compost. Um, you know, combines all of those things. You know, it is one of the most creative processes in the ecological system, and you know, one which is you know so sort of overlooked um, mm. by you know all but the most ardent. You know, sort of permaculturalists or, or organic gardeners as such you know, as a creative process you know, for the most part it's just looked at as a way to manage waste with some productive output so I, I think it's very eloquent and incredibly powerful that, that you've come to this point from the discovery genesis being something purely creative but also very personal so I just wanted to take a moment and reflect and honor that uh, you know, at this junction before we sort of leap a long way, you know, sort of over so much of your story, which yes, potentially we'll, we'll have a chance to explore in, you know, in another day, either, you know, sort of uh, once we can be face to face or, or in a, in a recorded format. Um, but let's just, let's just sort of hold ourselves back just a moment or two. You know, you mentioned in some of the correspondence that we had, you know, sort of in between our, our previous conversation and today that, you know, you started, you know, kind of playing around with compost as a bit of a hobbyist. So, so what even got you to that point of, you know, sort of building these things in the backyard? What piqued your interest, interest specifically in composting? Mm. It, it's an interesting part or byproduct, I, I think, of anyone's preoccupation. And I think it's segueing that into dyslexia. I didn't necessarily intellectualize or got into a ecological mindset it was more and it's this is in many ways quite indicative of dyslexics a very intuitive uh don't intellectualize don't think too much about it but you're looking at this food waste which i think obviously is very much interested or triggered part of my past and my upbringing looking at this level of food waste and understanding a little about what happens to food or organic waste as it breaks down. And then it doesn't take, it's not rocket science to think about the forest floor and what's happening in the forest floor uh, through decaying matter of, of all persuasions and time. And then looking at the whole ecology and this planet and then bringing it back to, well, if I, do this, my outcome is really rich, verdant, amazing soil. And the byproduct of that was producing healthy food and looking at all everything in between. So it, again, I didn't really intellectualize about it. I just did it and it was a very automatic thing to do. And, and I, you know, there was very little science on my part. There was no training. Uh, there was no indoctrination. There was no trends. So we're talking about 40 years ago. And it felt, it felt natural. And I think that was part of being brought up in a country town where things were very basic, working, experiencing, viewing, encounters were on a very basic level. So... Um, and it was only, it's only maybe, and of course, when I purchased my first home with, at the age of 27, 28, um, it was a derelict dwelling. And 
I had this preoccupation of recycling. And we're talking about 1985 here. And that whole 20 year obsession with that house had me being harassed by the local, local council because of me not getting building permits, but just recycling, reusing waste to an obsessive level and having the ability to put elements together to create form function. So this is, it's been a very organic process, which I feel very lucky because if an individual were in this situation today, it would be pretty fraught in, in many ways. In some areas, it's a lot easier. In some other ways, it's actually more challenging because it was easier then to build illegally and um, to get away with lots of things. I guess it's a bit like the, the punk movement where today, um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a different tuning. It's a different tuning at a different time. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. No, no, I, I, yeah, I get it. Absolutely. Um, I entirely missed out on the punk movement. I got a little bit of the grunge movement. That was my, <laughs> they're, they're, they're kind of time stamping both of us there. Um, I was just referring to sort of social form of anarchy where uh, in my time you could get away with stuff like this because the councils were, the East Fremantle Council was a very small council. I think it was one of the smallest in Australia. And, um, you know, a lot of things were, if people weren't complaining, they just went under the radar. Mm. I guess that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. No, no, I get it. I think, it, you know, again, coming from, you know, hearing that, receiving that from someone who comes from, you know, a very creative visual arts background, you know, to someone who has a very strong tendency to over-intellectualize, you know, I, I have some very small modicum of creativity, but it's much more driven out of sort of compare and contrast analysis. Um, what I'm receiving is an anecdote around, you know, sort of successful innovation, which I think is, is, in many ways more problematic today because we have so much regulation and we have so much pressure on immediacy of return and, and, and success, you know, the willingness to say, well, you know, let's not overthink something. Let's just give it a go and see what happens, accepting that there'll be an outcome, which is undefined and unregulated, um, you know, stymies, you know, sort of the, the likelihood of, you know, an exponential outcome, you know, mm. Like you can, if you kind of box something in and you, you plan it up the wazoo, sure, you'll get an outcome. But what's the likelihood of that outcome being anything more than a moderate incremental improvement versus we're going to stuff up a lot, but you know what? You know, you kind of, you bang enough rocks together, one of them's going to break open with a diamond in the middle. And, and, and that's, you know, really what you're looking for. You know, that is a, I forget who it is, but there's this fabulous um, designer who, who, who sort of said, you know, when it comes something along the lines of when it comes to impact, you know, there's three possible responses, you know, yes, no, and wow. And wow oh. is it wow is the one you're aiming for. Um, so and, and and awkward segue perhaps, but you, you had a wow moment that you mentioned in some of your preparation um, for today. Uh, you know, you're 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 mucking around, pun intended, you know, with this mucky stuff. Um, and and then I think as you, as you said, you were traveling and had some moments of realization around the prospect of the application, you know, for this concept that you were sort of tinkering with, um, mm. you know, for, a, for a, you know, maybe a, as, a, as a moment of calling. So could you, could you talk a little bit about those instances? Sure. Um, I'll sort of segue and we'll come back in. Yeah, so please most, do, please do. Most, most of my learning has come from traveling because I've never read a book in my life. Um, it's it, that worldly experience has come from traveling. And I have to say also listening to Radio National. Um, but in, the, in those travels, I always took an interest in how communities in different environments, different countries functioned. And, and I just took a personal interest in waste. So I just, I could not believe how wasteful we are. We know this. And then... And then in a very random way, I started looking at 
this race being this waste being a potential resource. Having said that, I also look at when I'm looking at systems or objects or yeah, systems or objects, looking at the weakest link. And that's a preoccupation of being super critical with what I do, um, what I'm building, what I'm making, or what I'm viewing. And by far, this was one of the, the greatest weak link was in the waste stream for me and the need to compost on location and to it to be made a lot easier. What was apparent to me, certainly over the last 40 years, is looking at domestic systems in the case of composting and finding out that many of these systems were not conducive for an Australian climate. And there were really basic, very basic, simple systems to rectify. Having said that, and I'm jumping straight into composting because... Um, no, let's go there. <laughs> uh, this is what nature has been doing since time immemorial on this planet, is, which is die and decay in a natural environment, whether that would be um, any sort of geographical terrain of any description, you actually had a natural sense of organic decay, which enabled us to have fresh water, enabled us to have fertile soils and, and abundant ecological uh, plant species in abundance. But when I started hearing about, it was almost about 10 years ago now, that 50% of the Earth's land mass has been cleared for industrial monocultures, for urbanization, cattle grazing, various forms of deforestation, has removed 50% of the Earth's land mass in 100 years. 50% in 100 years. To be quite honest, it made me stop and think what's going on here. So this whole ecological decomposition that created a life force was being heavily compromised and then taking an interest with environmentalists around the world, listening to their input uh, without reading, but again, listening to radio uh, and taking every opportunity to listen to public speaking. Um, and then gravitating to my personal interest, moving away from art to ecology and thinking, wow, this is a quantum leap from dealing about, as a practicing artist, dealing with cultural identity, then shifting that to the next level and exploring um, sustaining civilization on this planet and and soil and waste became god it became slightly obsessed and quite emotive on my part because i intuitively not intuitively i'll just stop all the crap but it actually makes me incredibly emotional to think that we are taking on every level and not giving back to this planet or to this civilization. We have this amazing ability to just rape and pillage from this planet. And it was only a question of time uh, that implosions in various levels were going to take place. And over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, certainly over the last 18 years, this has been on my radar and and it was not rocket science. It was only a question of time. And to think that massive compromises were going to take place in my lifetime, what can I do? What can I, what can I do to build and create and share and unite with others feeling the same? And that comes from a very utopian viewpoint from my level because... I was wanting to engage, but without any commercial interests. 
I wanted to participate without acknowledging it being fashionable or what have you, but diving in as dyslexics can do purely intuitively dive into something they believe in and being at times a bit reckless, not knowing what the outcome was going to be and thinking of financial returns or similar. And so that diving into something you believe in and having faith um, felt very natural, scary, but natural, risky. I didn't have a family if I was going to stuff up. There was only me to blame. So I sort of entered the space over the last 18 years, certainly in the last eight to eight years more so, and um, being a part of a whole worldwide movement now, which is pretty, uh, very exhilarating to be part of, but the throttle's on now. This is, we're moving so quickly um, to be a part of change, um, yeah, it's a big, it's a big area. No, it's enormous. No, no, I, yeah. so I've just been, yeah, it, it's been very easy to, to not say anything for someone who's a kind of a compulsive interrupter. Um, it's been, it's been great to just kind of step back and, 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 and let you, let you, you, you deliver that, 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 you know, incredible message. And I mean, there's, there's one thing that stands out of it, um, for me, which is, you know, all these great conversations I'm having and, you know, the, 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 the conception of this platform to really, you know, sort of as someone who is intrinsically an anthropologist, you know, someone who wants to understand people and why they do what they do, and then someone who works with leaders, what I really want to understand is why those who strive to make the world better do what they do and why they lead the way they do. And one of the very, very clear threads that was in the sort of the hypothesis that I'm, you know, in a way kind of trying to disprove, but you know, it keeps being validated is that if you want to make the world better, you, it begins internally with a discovery of purpose and everybody who's out there banging any kind of drum shaped object saying, come get your purpose here. Um, yeah, is essentially, you know, sort of singing a false truth because it has to come intrinsically. Um, you know, you, you know, sort of had this, you know, sort of, yeah, in, you know, irrepressible or, you know, unquenchable, you know, sort of uh, desire to get involved and, and, and you found your medium now, you know, through this, this, you know, sort of waste, you know, sort of process that you can contribute to. Um, but it's all a purpose to, you know, to, to contribute at a higher level, to be part of something. Mm. And wow, you know, sort of hasn't it all come together? And yeah, the throttle <laughs> is all the way, you know, sort of open now. Goodness me. I mean, the exponential success of Subpod, we're, we're going to get there in a minute. Um, but also, the, you know, the strengthening and the scaling of this movement, you know, as, as you quite rightly describe it, um, yeah, is, is, is definitely gathering you know, momentum on both yeah. counts. So, go on. What were you yeah. going to say? I think you said something that really touched me, which was medium. When you're teaching art, often they say, well, what medium do you work in? And um, when you mention medium, it's, it, it has been and it is finding my medium, and which is composting. But uh, having said that, the other part of that medium for me on a personal level, which is embracing the composting, is allowing my abilities, being an inventor, to nurture that inner space of the inventor because it's only in the last three or four weeks that I'm also looking at a new invention project for a better word but finding that medium and creating connectivity to that i think um is is very apparent but i think with many dyslexics what they get to a point where they know what they know and they acknowledge profoundly what they don't know and what they don't know is equally if not 
to a greater degree acknowledged. So if they're going to create an equation, they know what they know and they know what they don't know and they're really honest about it. And to complete the equation, they enter that space on, on their terms of working with another, uh, creating different solutions to get to that point. But often it's working with a team of people. And that is what I'm really present to, is you know what you know and what you don't know is just as important and it becomes even greater in completing the equation in the mindset. And I'm thinking of people like Branson, Bill Gates, and many other folk that we know of. That's in many ways where they have created their dynasty as dyslexics. Does yeah, that make sense? No, Does it makes sense? perfect sense. I mean, I was about to say, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's a prophetic statement. If we need one, we can, yeah, press stop there and kind of go, right, great. <laughs> mm. There's some valuable, you know, sort of leadership insight for a leadership podcast you know, from Andrew Hayne DeVries right there, because I think that is the, that is the genesis of productive and high performing teams is that everybody takes ownership of what they do know and what they don't know. And then they look around the room and go, ah, but it's okay that I don't know that because that person knows all about that. And that person knows all about that and so on and so on, you know, and it's that humility and that vulnerability that comes from that introspection that actually allows somebody you know, definitely as a leader, but even, even as a participant, you know, in, in a team following a leader to say, it's okay, I'm here to, to serve this function. You know, Steve Jobs didn't invent the iPad. You know, he started making great computers and then tablets came along and he went, oh, I can do that in my way and let's see how it goes. You know, same with the phone, same with the iPod, etc. cetera. Um, you know, he, he knew that his way of looking at things delivered a lot of value to people. And so he could take a concept and sort of recreate it through his eyes and that that would add a lot of value and that would land with a lot of people. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. certainly haven't invented composting or composting systems, but the way that you're looking at it is obviously resonating you know, with a lot of people if, if, if we just look at your order book um, yeah. or the order book of the business. So let's just circle back, if we may, to you know, this. You're, you're traveling. You've got a, uh, an awakening that, you know, there, there's an opportunity here, there's a purpose and a great one, you know, on a, on a sort of a far larger scale. And you touched on the issue of, you know, sort of composting in different climates, but, you know, certainly you and I have discussed, you know, that there's a, there's a, a an opportunity here for your systems to be applied in a number of different ways and in, in different parts of the world. So can you speak about that a little bit, please? Sure. Uh, a prime example would be, which is on my private website, haimdevries.com, or the Subpod website, subpod.com. If you look at them projects and you'll see Talala Retreat, which is in the southern tip of Sri Lanka, and the owner actually lives here in Byron Bay. It's a very large resort. It's a very established resort. And peak time is 150 people, 150 guests, and large staff and a large volume of waste. And what's also apparent because it's a rainforest is a lot of carbon waste. Yeah. So he flew me over there to spend one week doing an audit and, and what became apparent, and I sort of had insight from dealing with Indonesia and it's a little in the past, that if I were to design an in-ground compost system, it needed to be in a physical environment to be conducive to compost in a tropical environment, meaning it had to have a roof over it. The sub pod had to be larger. It had to be vented tenfold. And so I created an environment. I actually created a facility. <coughs> I created a facility in the resort that was a mini waste plant that was growing food. So it had to have no smells, no odors, no rats. With the carbon waste, it, the biochar facility had to have no smoke. 
because it was in the middle of the resort. So designing the facility, which embraces the subpod for the tropics, um, I had to make sure that when this was set up, that it didn't fall over. So complete engagement with management and the gardening staff was, was a massively apparent. Getting on board the soil faculty of the University of Rahuna, which I visited during that week and met and got the dean of the faculty on board and in turn the farm manager, Yudesh, who became the custodian and employed one day a week by the resort to spend uh, one day a week managing and maintaining and problem solving on my behalf, but also making sure it didn't fall over. The Soil Institute of Sri Lanka, I invited in and did a show and tell and a green school in, 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 in Sri Lanka. So we had presentations, and so what happened, I did the reconnaissance for one week, went back to Byron Bay, mapped out costs, designs, made contact with these organizations, and then notified the, the owner that this is what I'm thinking based on all the stats of food waste, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, we can do this, we can do that. And then we spent six weeks building the facility now it's building a mini waste facility that's growing food. Or you could say a growing food environment that's fed waste. It just depends which way you choose to look at it. Now the worm, the subpod tropic became worm farm hotel. And I had 10 very large subpods in above ground encased in carbon and manure so it breathed and cooled the whole composting down and the roof had to be passive solid design to make sure no sun no rain hit the actual interior of the worm farm hotel and the biochar facility had to be systematically designed to be high efficiency in a small space to take all the carbon waste and create an educational platform to create a tour, potential tourist educational component for guests, staff, and dignitaries to come to. So it had a multi-leveled approach and making it totally empowering the garden staff and the management and the local village in which they had access to because all the staff were employed from the village. So when you're building facilities like this, inclusion, uh, empowerment, that this could be set up by the thousands around Sri Lanka to deal with the food waste opposed to it being, being burnt or dumped into ravines. And we're only talking about the organic waste here. We're talking about food and carbon. And we're not talking about plastics or metals, etc. But this, as a blueprint, could be implemented all around the world in equatorial regions that could be built by the locals and uh, wherever possible connectivity with government and commercial facilities in the case of resorts, for example. Um, and that's humongous and I get really, really excited because I've been wanting to do this. The second stage of this is doing this in Bali, in Ubud, which I've been waiting now for two years to do. Okay. Okay. Well, look, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's an enormous opportunity on so many levels, right? I mean, I can absolutely see, you know, the, the personal and the passion born opportunity for you to really kind of drive this thing home. But I think on so many levels, it's an opportunity, you know, for people and communities and, you know, governments, you know, local, state, national, global, you know, to get involved with this. I mean, we, I worked in a hotel as one of my early career jobs and, you know, seeing the amount of food that, you know, went in the trash every day um, and, you know, growing up, you know, on acreage and having had compost at home, I was used to doing this at home and you know, just didn't understand why it wasn't something that, that was done there. And then, you know, like you traveling around the world and just seeing 
you know sort of food just kind of everywhere you know and this this is a this is a opportunity that exists in every household you know in every restaurant in every hotel in every office building that's catered in the world um yeah and it's an opportunity to create you know a nourishing you know life-giving product and to reduce yeah health risks from contamination and pollution and vermin and all those things and you know have more nutrition from the food that's grown in this stuff so that all sounds great yeah just in of itself just when we talk about food and waste but then we come to the climate impact and you know one of the things that we touched on in our very first conversation you know this fantastic you know sort of bible that i reference constantly now paul hawkins drawdown book you know composting might sit there at number 60 on his sort of ranking of 80 but it's one of the most accessible you know sort of things to get involved in especially at a domestic level you know i'm not going to go and build a solar farm i might might get some panels on my roof but i can certainly compost everything that my you know family produces as organic waste so let's just talk a little bit about the commercialization and the sort of, you know, the, the becomings of this thing, you know, as a, as an entity and as a business. And as you were reflecting on, you know, sort of when we were talking off air, you know, sort of your learnings, you know, about leadership and bringing mm. a team together and the way that they've needed to work with you, you yep. know, as, as the, 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 you know, the dyslexic brains trust behind the whole thing. I think um, this is possibly, um, I mean, it's a great question because, when I look back over the last four years and how I entered the space and the challenges that I had and the massive obstacles that I've had to overcome and those obstacles are still there. I think anyone in my situation who has not been working in the business sector, in the case of being a visual artist for 35 years, I would say to them, you're moving into the business world. And with that goes personalities. With that goes um, personal um, preoccupations that people have. Um, Self-interest. Where does self-interest lie to the collective interest in the business that you're creating? And self-interest can't help but sneak in and create mayhem. So in my case, if I was going back four or five years, I would get a mentor, business mentor, to help you on this journey, independent of the team that you're working with. Um, I would definitely check in with them each week. I would definitely check in with in the case of an inventor coming on board that you get a lot of legal advice, you get as much assistance and help and guidance as possible and such that you can understand X amount because you're entering into a new language, you're entering into a new realm. And that would have relieved a lot of stress and confusion on my part and especially especially at my age i'm 64 now so i sort of entered the space at about 60 um all pretty foreign to me and so i would get yeah seek a business mentor and check in once a week and he or she really needs to be uh, a very effective communicator. So entering the space for me, that's crucial. And two, learning about communication. So I joined Toastmasters, for example, about three and a half years ago, and that's helped me a great deal. Getting, getting your thoughts and your concerns and your sense of self-expression out there regardless of how it fitted into the mindset of your business partners and knowing too well that they'll never really understand the way you function and don't assume that that's they will come on board thinking and responding to what you're saying that's being pretty naive and i think i fell into that space accepting the fact that that they're going to think and process things differently 
and you need to be aware of that. Am I making sense, Tim? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think yeah, there's there's a singularity in all of that, which I think is you know, again, it comes back to your earlier point about knowing what you know and what you don't know. You know, like you know how to conceive of an idea, you know how to view innately and intuitively essentially an opportunity. You know, what you don't know is how business works and how business communicates and you know how business thinks when it comes to how do we realize this opportunity and then map the process that takes the concept from here and gets to the outcome over there. You know, those were all the things that you didn't know. And yeah, you know, a mentor, you know, would have made a contribution, you know, a coach would have made a contribution, an advisor would have made a contribution. Um, but no doubt you've learned, you know, along the way. And yeah, you know, we would all do things differently for the most part if we had our time again. But you know, the, the key thing is that you know we're still here and you know we're moving forward mm, and we mm. can learn and, and, and keep progressing. But no doubt, you know, it's been an interesting journey. I mean, what what sort of observations would you make now as to what you sort of believe the role of a leader is, especially one who's orientated towards striving to make the world better and have you know serving a higher purpose? Yeah. I think first and foremost is uh, the need for one to be very clear about your goals and objectives. And yeah, reaching out, having a mentor. I think this is really, really important. But above all is being and learning about effective communication. I, I can't help that uh, the need to express unconditionally what you feel and what you think. And in, in between dealing with your team and having a business mentor and engaging in activities like public speaking or similar, I think would be really, really beneficial if the team are not providing that surface for service for a dyslexic or someone on the spectrum, then I think it's, it's really essential that people look for uh, outlets and vehicles to prop them up and um, learn how to recalibrate, learn how to uh, refresh for a better word. Um, your mindset, so you keep you keep incredibly clear. And if that's not happening with the team, then and it should be. Uh, having said that, that there needs to be a team leader or CEO of your company that is profoundly thinking of the well-being and the collective of the of of, of the people in charge or on top or making decisions. And obviously that's going to filter right through the workforce as equals. Everyone has to be considered as equals. So being mindful of self-interest and being mindful of the collective and therefore keeping to your goals or to one's goals. It's a big area, but that would be my basis to start from. No, I think that's, I think that's perfect. I think it's invaluable. And I think, again, there's a real congruence in there around, well, I'm, I'm just going to reduce it right down to being truthful, mm. right? You know, if, if you're true to oneself and you can then set, you know, a goal that is real you know, and honours, you know, what you truly believe, I think that that then kind of provides a passage through which to communicate you know, very concisely and clearly. Um, and I think the thing about truth is that it's, it's, I think it's by definition, it's, it's an equivalent form. Because mm-hmm. um, I don't know about you, but I'm not too sure about this. You know, this is my fact. I don't know about your facts. And you know, my, okay. my truth is different to your truth. Truth is truth. And, and, and therefore it's equal to everybody. Um, and, and so, I mean, d- d- tell me if you agree with that. Um, no, I do. I totally. Not. And I think that's where, you know, many companies 
certainly minority, but many companies uh, obviously working from is a place of equality and one's truth to someone else's personal truth or collective truth is, is different. So again, that, that communication across the platform is paramount and you need a united team. The big one, I think in industry is finding the right people to connect with and that you have the same goal. We just individually go about it slightly differently, but you treat each other incredibly respectfully as equals. And uh, again, what seems to compound this is people's self-interest, mm. which I think uh, is unfortunate because it uh, muddies the waters on so many levels. Yeah, I think the the the, the key link um, in finding the right people is alignment. Uh, yeah, alignment on a number of levels. But again, I think to your point, if you if you if you know who you are, if you know what you're doing, and you know why you're doing it, and then you can communicate that very clearly. In my experience and my own journey of discovery with this, once you communicate what you stand for and why you're doing it very very clearly, the right people come along mm. because they can receive that message and they can essentially it resonates with them, and they can then say, well, that is exactly what I'm in for. And then their own self-interest is actually being served in a way which is positive and productive because it aligns with yours and with the greater collective entity. It's when the message is not clear or the goals aren't known or the truth is interpretive, then you end up with this sort of systemic dysfunction because everybody's only reliant on self-interest because there isn't an alignment. There isn't a congruence for, mm. for them to follow. Um, totally agree. But, Totally agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, thank you for you know, so much for sharing so much of your journey and your experience and your wisdom. And I appreciate that this is a, a journey that you're still on. And, you know, at one point there, I, I let it go. But, you know, you mentioned the last three or four weeks, you know, you've been, you've been cooking up a new invention. So I will look forward to, I hope I can stay in touch and, and hear more of that in due course. But we are but quickly approaching the sort of the ding dong moment where, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the standard, um, you know, sort of time period is about to elapse. So on the note of clear communication, if somebody wants to communicate directly with you, what is the best way of them doing that? I would say email me or indeed ring me, but I have my own uh, private um, website, which is andrew at hayamdevries.com. Yeah, email. Yeah, and I think there's there's a LinkedIn profile as well there. So I'll include I'll inc- include all of that stuff in the show notes so that people can, you know, no doubt be inspired by the journey and uh, and what, be intrigued to to hear about more. So look, I mean, I'll I'll just you know sort of um, again express gratitude for for you, you know, accepting my invitation to have a conversation with me and for making the time and being so open to share your journey. You know, with me and, and with the audience here today uh, and congratulate you on the phenomenal success of Subpod, you know, and you, you and everybody that's contributed to it. And, you know, I hope that that continues and that sustains, you know, the, the greater mission that you have ahead of you. Yeah. I'd just like to say this, Tim. Please. There's a, a huge team of people behind Subpod and they all play an amazing, important role. And they've worked hard and, and, and they're reaping the benefits of that now, which is fantastic. But I also just want to acknowledge what you're doing, Tim. If we're, we're talking about people's stories and we are creating access to people's individual journeys, and if that's helping or contributing by listening or, or, or some form of sharing and building a more, progressive system in our current environment communication and being inspired and hopefully not making too many errors but it's that's that's law of life and learning from these errors and building i'm all for it but tim gratitude thank you well we're completely aligned there that that's the whole purpose of this um and I, I will accept that 
express with gratitude very gratefully <laughs> trying desperately not to use the word in, in the reciprocal definition um but no thank you uh, that that really does touch me and and, and strike a chord so I, I appreciate it uh yeah this is the mission that i'm on uh, this is my you know the, the, the only contribution i i can make you know is through what i know you know I know leaders and, 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 and how to work with them and, and hopefully get the best out of them. So thank you for that. And thank you for today and onward with the journey. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure. You'll find audio and video recordings for this episode, as well as links and related resources mentioned today in the podcast area of foureyeleadership.com backslash insights. This is the Better World Leaders podcast brought to you by 4 Leadership. 